Renal disorders. Renal disorders are related to the function of the kidney. They include several forms of renal failure. Many patients have known have known renal failure as a complication of diabetes or hypertension. It can be acute or chronic and it affects the kidney's filtering system. Both within the kidney intrinsic and from other causes, um, pre-renal and post-renal um, acute or chronic renal failure. It can also be classified by the amount of urine that is produced by the diseased kidney. The underlying problem occurs with renal disorders outside the urinary system. This is called pre-renal. In the kidney, this is the intrinsic. After the urine leaves the kidney, this is the post-renal. There are two types of renal or kidney failure, acute and chronic. Acute renal failure is the sudden loss of kidney function that develops as a result of an injury or damage to the body in general, or the kidneys in particular. Acute renal failure is caused by a blockage of urine flow out of the kidneys and into the bladder. Exposure to certain drugs and or toxic substances, or significant loss of blood, or a sudden drop in blood flow to the kidneys. Kidneys that have pre-existing disease or damage are at higher risk for acute renal failure. Signs and symptoms include confusion, drowsiness, decreased urine output, pusmal breathing, dyspnea, tachypnea, and coma. Acute renal failure is a very serious condition with a mortality rate in excess of 50%. Chronic renal failure develops over a much longer period of time as nephrons lose their ability to function and are replaced by scar tissue. Usually, this takes place over the course of many years. In the early stages, there may be no symptoms and progression may be so gradual that symptoms do not occur until kidney function is less than one-tenth of normal. Diabetes and hypertension are the two most common causes and account for approximately two-thirds of the cases of chronic renal failure. The goal of treatment for all renal failure is to identify and treat any reversible causes, as well as preventing excess accumulation of fluids and wastes, while allowing the kidneys to heal and gradually resume their normal function. In some cases, dialysis may be necessary. Dialysis is a method of removing toxic substances from the blood when the kidneys are unable to do so. Some patients may require a renal transplant to implant a healthy kidney into a patient with kidney disease or kidney failure. Renal failure is categorized by the amount of urine still made by the diseased kidney. Oliguria is a term that is defined by making urine but less than 400 to 500 milliliters in 24 hours. Anuria is when someone makes urine uh, less than 100 milliliters in a 24 hour time frame. Non oliguric is indications of renal failure in greater than 400 to 500 milliliters per 24 hours. And then polyuria is when the kidney produces too much urine and they urinate very frequently. Acute renal failure, you have loss of renal function over hours to days. Now when we say loss of renal function, we mean a decrease in the glomerular filtration rate. When you have a loss of renal function, you start having accumulation of waste. Most of, them, most of the waste are nitrogen containing. Azotemia means levels of waste substances are increased. Uremia means signs and symptoms of renal failure accompany azotemia. 60% of cases have pre-renal causes such as shock and hypoperfusion. Intrinsic renal failure is caused by problems in the kidney such as with the glomerulus or the tubules. 
and comprise up to 40% of cases. Underlying causes include lupus, infection, toxins, ischemia of the kidney, and certain medications. Up to 5% of the cases are from postrenal causes, such as obstruction of urine outflow. For example, a blocked ureter or an enlarged prostate gland may block the urine flow. IV fluids in these kind of patients can worsen the problem. And with all patients, you want to um, be very judicious in the uh, amount of fluids that you give, even when they're hypotensive. It could result in um, renal failure or pulmonary edema. Elderly patients with a decrease, uh, history of decreased blood volume may fall under the pre-renal. Dry mucous membranes, tinting the skin, poor capillary refill, and difference in orthostatic vital signs and e extreme thirst, also maybe um, assessment findings. This a lot of times is caused by CHF, cirrhosis of the liver, and sepsis. Postrenal you see indications of the bladder outlet is obstructed. It results in a backflow of urine into the kidney. Acute obstructions, the patient may be in agonizing pain and unable to urinate. This could be stones or stenosis. Giving IV fluids will worsen the situation. The intrinsic acute renal failure is caused by damage to the kidney itself. It's categorized by glomeruli, tubules, interstitium, renal blood vessels, primary involved in the portion. Glomerular intrinsic renal failure is caused by systemic lupus, erythematosus or lupus, autoimmune disease, and other things. Tubular disorders are common and they're caused by toxins or ischemia. This is medications or, or lack of blood flow to the kidneys themselves. Interstitial disorders are caused by medications. Vascular renal disorders are caused by blood clots affecting blood flow in the kidney. And these are common cause of renal failure in adult, older adults. Renal artery stenosis is a reversible cause of hypertension and they're able to go in and open up the renal artery. In management, you want to remove the offending agents maintain fluid status close to normal, and any type of renal failure can leave the patient without functioning kidneys which may require dialysis or will require dialysis. Chronic renal failure is irreversible kidney dysfunction with an increased urea in blood for greater than three months. The patient retains waste products toxic to the system. The kidney controls the blood pressure, produces renin, Activates vitamin D and produces erythroproietin, which is what makes your red blood cells. So you don't want your kidneys to be in renal failure because it affects all systems of the body. When you have uremia, the urea, which is a waste nitrous nitrogen waste products, are not excreted normally by the kidneys. You may have a fishy odor, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. You may see GI bleeding. You may see heart failure, dysrhythmias, edema blood clotting disorders, you may see pericarditis or even pericardial tamponade. They also may have neurologic signs and symptoms and altered mental status. You also see skin rash and itching. The skin rash is um, associated with the buildup of the toxins in the blood and it starts being excreted from the um, skin. This is called pruritus. Skin ulcerations may occur as a result of the calcium in the urea being deposited in the skin, and this can lead to infections and death. In stage renal, uremia is requiring transplantation or dialysis. Hypertension is usually the cause in 23% of the cases of in stage renal. They may have um, glomerular nephritis or polycystic renal disease. Here's a picture of a artificial vascular graft and you see that the um, radial artery and the cephalic vein are connected and this is where they would do the dialysis. It's in the graft. They would insert a needle, in, a needle from the uh, vein and a needle to go into the artery. 
Shunt grafts are a synthetic form body to which a body can react by blood clot formation that prevents flow through them. So you may have patients that have clotted grafts and that could lead to, um, to ischemia. During your physical exam, lightly touch the graft site. If the blood is flowing through it, there will be a thrill. Not an exciting moment, but a light vibration. If the thrill is not there, it may mean the graft is clotted. Determine if the site is warm or tender to the touch, suggesting infection. And here's a patient that is receiving hemodialysis. And this patient's hooked up to the dialysis machine, which takes the blood, filtrates it, and then takes the filtered blood back into the body. When you have hemodialysis, a catheter is placed in the subclavian area and access site is placed in one arm, a shunt or a graft. A shunt graft, arterial blood leaves the body to enter the tubing and conducts it into the uh, dialysis machine. Dialysis removes the waste in the urea from the blood. Patients on medication are at re increased risk of infection and most of these patients will be on medications. You may have complications of blood clots, infections, thrombosis, stenosis. The graft will stop bleeding and they're not able to use it. This may cause psycho psychological issues because these patients are having to go to dialysis three times a week, which really um, changes their daily life. You may see signs of malnutrition. They'll probably be hypertensive, have high cholesterol. And you may even see, like we talked about, the uh, pruritus and other skin rashes. Hyperkalemia, which is high potassium, is often a cause of cardiac arrest in patients with renal failure. Peritoneal dialysis is a different type of dialysis, which isn't as efficient, but this is where catheters placed in the abdomen and large quantities of fluid are placed in the abdomen. The toxins in the blood equilibrate into the abdomen by osmosis. We remove the toxins without the dialysis machine or trips to the dialysis center. A lot of patients do uh, peritoneal dialysis at home. It's portable and small. Hypotension is not a side effect, but it is, again, less efficient. A patient in end-stage renal disease is going to need a renal transplant to ever get back to normal life and not have to go to dialysis. There's a greater need than any other number of organs that are available. The first year survival rate of a renal transplant patient is 85 percent. Kidney is placed in the lower abdomen attached to the iliac arteries and the kidney can be felt on an abdominal exam. Post-transplant patients are going to have to be on immunosuppressant medications. Most patients die of cardiac causes or infection because of the immunosuppressant medications. Post-transplant patients will be on immunosuppressant medications, steroids and others including cyclosporin, tacrolimus, this one I'm not going to even try to pronounce, and this other one I'm not even going to try to pronounce. Medications cause adrenal suppression, poor wound healing, osteoporosis, and susceptibility to infection. They also affect the skin, hair, and the posture because of malnutrition and lack of um, nutrients. Acute urinary retention. A lot of times the underlying problem is because of benign prostatic hypertrophy. That's where the prostate gets too large to allow flow of urine to get out in older men. Prostate enlarges to prevent flow of urine. The backup of, of urine in the bladder causes severe discomfort. Backup through the ureters into the kidney results in acute renal failure because the toxins are staying in the kidneys. It can also have nervous system effects, spine injuries, and over distension in the bladder can lead to urinary retention. Boluses of IV fluids obviously can worsen the condition. However, we say that the acute urinary retention most often is caused by benign prostatic um, hypertrophy, but it can also occur in women as well. Now we're going to talk about renal calculus, which is a, um, a kidney stone. This is a CT image of a patient that has one, if you look right here. Kidney stones can pass through the lower urinary tract, usually when they're less than 6 millimeters in size. 
You can have renal colic, which is pain caused by stretching, dilation, irritation of the affected ureter, causing smooth muscle to spasm. Very, very painful. Occurs more often in men than in women, and usually between ages 35 and 45. The composition of a renal calculi can vary. Um, it can be made of, of several different things. They'll have constant severe blank pain, radiating to the groin, the lower abdominal pain, tenderness over the costovertebral angle, nausea, blood in the urine. But you still want to consider your differential diagnoses. Emboluses of fluids and um, pushing oral fluids can flush out the stone and alleviate the pain if it's small enough to pass through the system. Urinary tract infections, UTIs, are more common in females than males because of the shorter urethra. Bacteria reaches the bladder before it's being before being eliminated. So with a shorter urethra, the, the bacteria has a shorter travel period to the um, bladder. It's common in patients who have indwelling catheters. And the reason why is because there's constantly a foreign body that opens up a pathway for the pathogens. This can affect the urethra, the prostate, and the bladder. Urethritis is a sexually transmitted infection, and this often comes from bacteria from the bowel. Infection in the prostate is very difficult to get rid of, and a lot of times you'll have like um, pus discharge and, and, and yellow and, and, and white, just nasty stuff. The infection in the bladder. Um, some of the signs and symptoms will be painful, frequent, cloudy, malodorous urine. And again, that's why you need to ask about their urine. Infections of the kidney lead to polynephritis. A lot of times a patient um, needs to be in a position of comfort. They can't get comfortable when they have UTIs. You need to start an IV, give fluids, and consider analgesics. Foley catheters are catheters that are placed through the urethra into the bladder to drain the urine. And again, these can lead to very high incidences of infection. Problems arising from Foley catheters, older patients who are confused and cannot control urination, and if they're confused, they may try to pull these catheters out. Patients with benign prostatic hyperplasia prior to surgery to prevent acute renal failure, so they're wanting to continue to allow the urine to drain. Critically ill patients who cannot um, urinate on their own, and patients with paralysis due to spinal cord injuries. A Foley catheter is a clear plastic tube with a balloon at one end inserted through the urethral meatus and urethra into the bladder. There's a clamp on the tubing which must be released for urine to flow into the collection bag. You want to place the bag lower than the bladder, unclamp it to prevent obstruction of urine flow. If you must place the bag at the patient's level to move him, clamp the tubing first and lower the bag to unclamp it. Confused patients may pull on a Foley. In some cases, pull it out with balloon inflated. This could cause severe trauma in the urethra. You want to evaluate for possible blood infections and trauma and look for signs of infection. UTIs may initially go unnoticed in the elderly. They can result in severe illness, vomiting, fever, and sepsis. You want to keep a urinary tract infection among your hypothesis when caring for an elderly patient with nonspecific signs of illness. A lot of times it could lead to severe altered mental status. Emergencies involving male genitalia. Fournier's gangrene. This is a bacterial infection in the skin that affects both the genitals and the perineum. You may have heard this called the um, flesh-eating bacteria. It develops from a wound or abrasion to the skin. Sometimes it can be just even very small as like a uh, infected hair follicle and then it could lead to a very large wound. Men are 10 times more likely to develop this than women. And this is a true emergency because they can get septic and die very quickly. Phimosis and paraphimosis. Phimosis is where the foreskin cannot be pulled back over the head of the penis. Urine builds in the foreskin and you'll see infections, irritation, and extreme swelling. Paraphimosis, the foreskin of uncircumcised male retracts, 
constricting the lymphatic drainage and causes glands to swell, tissue death, and necrosis. We'll want to apply an ice pack to decrease the swelling. A priapism is a painful and prolonged erection of the penis for more than four hours. The corpora cavernosa fills with blood for erection, but then it's unable to drain out. You may see this a lot of times in like distributive shock. Disease of blood buildup and sickle cell disease may um, also cause this as well. When not treated promptly, scarring and permanent inability to achieve erection, which is also called impotence, impotence can result. Apply ice packs to decrease swelling. And testicle torsion is very, very painful. This is where testicles rotate and twist the spermatic cord, cutting off blood supply to the testicle. If the torsion is not reversed within six hours, generally death of the testicle will occur. It's most common in boys and infants, but can occur at any stage of life. Nausea, vomiting, blood, and semen, lower abdominal pain, lump or swelling in the testicle, sudden, severe testicular pain are all signs and symptoms. Epididymitis and orchitis. Epididymitis is the inflammation of the epididymis at the posterior pole of the testicle. Young men who have sexually transmitted infections often have this, and also elderly men. Ice and elevation of the testicles will help. Orchitis is the inflammation of the testicle itself. Trauma to the male genitalia can be blunt or penetrating. It can be the result of insertion of a foreign body into the urethra. Accidental, self-induced, result of sexual assault. Tears and lacerations to the scrotum or the penis. The testicle falling out of the scrotal sac due to a laceration, or you can also have a fracture of the penis. Trauma to the male genitalia can be very distressing. You've got to be able to reassure the patient. You want to treat your life threats first. Although this could take a lot of attention, you need to control the bleeding, take steps to reduce swelling. And then also consider if this is a result of a sexual assault. How can you lessen the embarrassment of a patient with an injury involving the genitalia? Well, you can, you can try to make it comfortable for both of you. Maintain a professional attitude. But again, remember it, it is a priority for you to assess the situation and to make sure no life threats are, um, are not addressed. In gynecological disorders, you need to be caring, comfortable, knowledgeable for patient to share the information, provide patient with privacy. You may see abdominal pain, which may be a result of a gynecological obstet or an obstetric problem with different organ systems. You also want to ask questions about abnormal, abnormal vaginal bleeding, unusual vaginal discharge. You need to obtain the history of the menstrual cycles, ask when the last time they had a menstrual cycle. If they're pregnant, how many times? Pregnancies resulted in normal childbirth and were they healthy and are the children normal? Ask about contraceptive methods, what types of contraceptives they've been using. And then most of the time management of gynecological problems in the pre-hospital setting is supportive. Gynecological causes of abdominal pain is pain with ovulation. This is called metal schmerz, ovarian cyst, endometriosis, endometriitis, ectopic pregnancy, and pelvic inflammatory disease or cervicitis. Following ovulation, the egg is swept by the waving fimbriae into the fallopian tube, where fertilization and zygote implantation occurs locally. The developing fetus is accommodated at first by tubal stretching, followed by eventual rupture and fetal compromise. Other ectopic implantation sites include the ovary, abdominal cavity, and cervix. Abnormal, abnormal vaginal bleeding a lot of times it's pregnancy associated problems. They may experience heavy periods, which could lead to hypovolemia, trauma, 
You want to ask them how many sanitary pads or tampons are saturated with blood in an hour's time, and that can give you an indication of the bleeding. You want to look for signs of hypovolemic shock. Female genitalia trauma and sexual assault. Small cuts and lacerations occur in the female and pediatric population from straddling injuries. You need to control significant bleeding, discomfort or swelling. You want to apply an ice pack and you always want to consider sexual assault, but you want to approach it in a manner that isn't threatening. Males and females of all ages may be victims of sexual assault. You need to look for clues in your scene size up, your primary secondary assessment, and also you need to manage the injuries and you're not there to, to pass judgment, but just treat your patient. You need to preserve evidence of legitimate concern. You need to place the garments that may be evidence removed in a paper bag. And you want to discourage the patient from bathing. And this, a lot of times with sexual assaults with women is, is hard to do because the patient oftentimes will report that they just feel dirty and that they need a bath. But you want to reinforce that we need to get evidence. They will have psychological needs if they've been sexually assaulted. You need to reassure the patient that you're not there to pass judgment, but you're there to take care of them and to make sure that they are taken care of. Do not make statements or ask questions that imply the victim is at fault for the attack. And document anything the patient tells you about the assault because that will be something that you... Um, may come back to in the future. Both males and females of all ages can be victims of sexual assault. In addition to the care you normally provide, realize the importance of emotional support and preservation of evidence. Sexually transmitted infections, STIs. The patients often feel shame and embarrassment and they may not tell you. You need to ask questions. You may delay treatment for signs and symptoms. You need to be empathetic and non-judgment, non-judgmental. And what are the five commonest STIs? Chlamydia, gonorrhea, herpes, syphilis, and HPV. And according to the CDC, there's 19 million new cases of sexually transmitted infections every year and that's just the ones that have been tested. So in summary, our goal was to understand anatomy, physiology, and pathophysiology of urinary and male and female reproductive systems. We know that patients may experience acute or chronic renal failure. The impairment of the kidney's role in homeostasis can lead to life-threatening complications. Patients with chronic renal failure receive hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis to remove waste from blood. Patients subject to significant complications related to the shunt grass and dialysis procedures. Urinary tract may be affected by UTIs, urinary obstruction, and renal calculi. Care of patients with renal and urinary disorders is supportive. Patients may benefit from IV fluid boluses. Renal failure patients may often be in cardiac arrest and you need to manage that in the pre-hospital setting as you would with any patient in cardiac arrest. Interventions may be ineffective until underlying electrolyte abnormalities in cardiac arrest are corrected. Emergencies involving male genitalia may be medical or traumatic in origin, can be emotionally distressing. Gynecologic disorders present with abdominal pain or vaginal bleeding. You want to obtain pregnancy and menstrual history. Both males and females of all ages can be victims of sexual assault. Realize the importance of emotional support and preservation of evidence. And you oftentimes will have patients with STIs that may seek pre-hospital medical care.